Hey there, gang. Patrick King here, and I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 20 of Talking About Horses. In these broadcasts, I try to bring you some of the best riders, horsemen, trainers, equine advocates, and thought leaders in the horse industry for tips, insights, and stories. You can listen at home, at work, in the car, or in the saddle, either through Facebook, YouTube, or by downloading the podcast from the iTunes store or wherever you get your podcasts. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by my good friend, Wendy Murdoch. Wendy is an internationally recognized equestrian author, instructor, and clinician for over 23 years. She teaches her students- Oh, longer than that, Oh, longer than that now? Oh, well, we've got to update your bio there. Okay, okay. 30, over 30 years. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Well, we need to update your bio on there. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let me get back to this introduction. <laughs> so, instructor and clinician for over 30 years, Wendy teaches her students how to do what great riders do naturally. Her desire to understand the function of both horse and human, as well as her love of teaching, capitalizes on the most current learning theories in order to show riders how to exceed their own expectations. I apologize for the mix-up in the intro, but Wendy, thank you so much once again for joining me. <laughs> it's always a pleasure, Pat. Oh, you. goodness. So, well, yeah, we've got to update your bio then on uh, on your Facebook page. Oh, okay. That's yeah, you got that. yeah, right. yeah so there we go. Website. See? Right. Oh, right. okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I must have been on Facebook for quite a while now then. There you go, right? So that's uh, that, that's our little way of checks and balances to make sure everything stays updated. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay, so for anybody who's tuning in and listening, and we've got a good handful of folks already tuning in, which is great to see. Um, for anybody that's tuning in uh, that maybe doesn't know who you are or what you do, uh, do you want to give them a little uh, a better introduction than what I just gave? Well, um, basically, in, uh, I'm a scientist by training. I have a master's degree in equine reproductive physiology. Um, while I was getting... Uh, I was going to go for a doctoral degree, but while I was in college at University of uh, Kentucky, I was running an event barn where a horse flipped over and then rolled over me and punched my femur through the socket. So that changed my life in about mm, 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, so instead of being a scientist, I met Linda Johnson Jones and Sally Swift and tried to figure out how to get my body functioning again so I could ride and... You know, that's, that was 1984, so that's, what is that, 34 years later? I'm still at it. <laughs> there you go. Wow, wow. So then it was through uh, through Linda that you learned about the Feldenkrais work then? Correct, yeah. Okay. Linda had trained with Dr. Feldenkrais at the San Francisco training in the 70s, and she combined her course knowledge with the Feldenkrais method to create the Tellington Jones Equine and Mayormus Method or team. Um, and somebody gave me a team newsletter while I was in the hospital, and I read that, and I realized I needed to change the way I was approaching horses. Oh, so that's what got you started. Okay. Yeah, yeah, really. Interesting. Like, yep. Hunter Purdy was a woman in Kentucky, and she walked into my, my hospital room, and she handed me a Tellington Jones newsletter and a little book called Richard uh, by Richard Bott called um, Illusions. And um, they kind of changed my focus and direction. <laughs> wow, wow. Yeah. Yep. So when when did Sally uh, Sally Swift enter the picture? So it, um, my first clinic with Linda was in um, October 85 to the day a year later after my accident. And oh. then at my second uh, team training, it was actually in Connecticut, in um, Washington, Connecticut. Um, Kim Walness was going to go to Gawler to ride in the WEG three-day. And so she brought Linda in to help her get her horse ready. And Sally Swift had already been working with Kim Wallace. And Sally came down to the clinic. And it was February 1986. And I was sitting there doing tail pulls on a horse's tail. And this little tiny woman with gray hair walks over and goes, oh, look, that's going all the way through his spine. And that was Sally Swift. No kidding. Wow, wow. Yep. Yep. That's very so, cool. So I met Sally in 86 in February. And then I took her instructor training um, in the summer of 86 in Colorado, um, where, uh, I met Robin Hood, Linda's sister, okay. and who is also teaching team internationally. And, uh, yeah, so, um, I met Sally in 86. I apprenticed with her in 1992 and, um, was one of 11 people to apprentice with her full time in the world. Really? Wow. Yep. Yeah. So 
long time ago now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. That was, that, I think that was a little part of your story that I didn't know. I didn't know the timeline on that. Yeah, yeah. So, 86, I met Sally, and then, um, like I said, 92, I apprenticed with her. And uh, and so, that, that sort of, I studied team with Linda for about 10 years, really intensely, and then I started working with Sally for the, sort of the next 10 years, and then that's, like, in 2001, I got a started taking the Feldenkrais training and that was 10 actually a little longer than that I studied Feldenkrais um, did quite a number of trainings for 16 years um, so and now what am I doing I know a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> and, and now you're all over the place right <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, wow. and it's, I think that's the way this goes, you know, it's, it's, there's so much that we touch on and so much that we explore and, and I'm sure you feel the same way. The more we learn, the more we see, the more paths we see open up for us. And, and the other kind of interesting thing in that, Patrick, which I'm sure you find as well, is that there's certain um, people that you keep sort of connecting to, even if it's 10 years later, mm -hmm. like kind of in this, in this, uh, swirl of thought that I think in, when you have a particular focus in your thought or a particular way in which you think about horses that you keep seeing certain names crop up over and over and over because they're they are sort of if you will in agreement with those concepts yeah um, so I've had some people come back into my life recently that I haven't you know heard or seen from in quite a while and then they're they they're Kind of cycling back again, so it's um, it's kind of fascinating. It's a small world, actually. It is, right, it is. It's global and small at the same time. Yeah. You know, yeah, which is so exciting. Yeah, it's, it's cool. So exciting. <laughs> yeah, and, and like I was here. I'm here on Martha's Vineyard at the Martha's Vineyard Community Horse Center, and I was a woman came in as a teacher on the island, and she, uh, Sally Swift, used to have a house on Martha's Vineyard. And so she knew really? Sally from the vineyard. Um, wow. Yeah, and worked with her like way early on in Sally's process. So you know, there's that kind of kind of that sinking moment where you run into someone that's that's known Sally from a, a whole different perspective from her summer island. Wow, that's very yeah. cool. Yeah, that's very that's cool. Like you said, everything kind of circulates around. Yep, it kind of touches back. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, okay, so our discussion this evening, uh, horseback safari. Yeah. So this is exciting, and I've been really I, lucky, I think, to share some conversations with you about this, and you've convinced me that I have to go at some point. I'm not sure when yeah, it's going to happen, sure. but absolutely, I have to go at some point. Uh, it's something I've always wanted to do, and then when you mix safari and horses, I mean, how can you say no to that, right? <laughs> but so... Uh, before we get into kind of talking about how it works and all that stuff, how did you get started with that? Well, and you know, here again, this is where team comes comes back again because in 1980, no, 1996 or seven, I'm I'm not sure which. Um, I went down to, in fact, this is so weird. So I went down to Florida because Robin Hood was doing a training at Ellie Jensen's place in um, Loxahatchee. And so I went down to assist Robin, and to, I was going to do some teaching, and I talked about saddle fit and stuff. And um, I went down, and one of the participants was this woman named Mary Robinson from Alaska. And I remember meeting her in the airport when we were coming in, and then um, at the end of the training, she was like, how would you like to take a group on horseback safari? And back then, it's like, you say yes to everybody, right? <laughs> Right, right. I don't anymore. Now I tell them you have to call my manager. Oh, well, that's nice. Well, you know, sure, of course. And so, you know, not not knowing how serious this woman was, and the next thing that's back in like AOL days, you know, my emails started okay. and uh -huh. the facts team started. And the next thing I know, Mary is like on to me, like, come on, we're putting this group together. And so, my first horseback safari was put together by Mary Robinson, and her company is was Horsing Around International, and um, the, the as those points of light touch, I was in Switzerland in September of this year, and the woman whom I've not seen, I haven't seen her since 2002, I think it is, um, uh, Bridget, 
she was at that training and she actually had photographs from that training in 1996. Wow, cool. And yeah, it was really cool because I didn't really remember it that well. And here's photographs of me teaching saddle fit, and here's Robin, and here's Ellie, and all these people that were there at that moment when I met Mary Robinson. That's very cool. Yeah, all these years later, and, and I reconnect with Bridget, who I haven't talked to in years. Right. The day that started it all, right? Yeah, exactly. And so the, our first safari was to Botswana, and we went to the Okavango Delta to, okay. um, um, in, it was 98, and we took 12 riders, and we flew into Harare, which is in Zimbabwe, and then we went from there to Victoria Falls, and then um, went out on safari out in Botswana. And on the very first ride, I remember it was, we all got up and went down to the barn and we got our horses and we're going out. And it wasn't even a half hour into the ride. <clears throat> and the grass was tall and it was golden at that point because it was dry season. Okay. And our guide goes, lion, talk loudly, walk slowly, do not run. And you're like, <laughs> What? <laughs> Welcome to Botswana. <laughs> and there you look in the grass, and there's these two little gold half circles, which are the lion's ears, the tips of the ears. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And we just, you know, everybody just started talking really loudly, and we just really quietly walked our horses away. And um, that safari, we saw so many lions. We saw a, a couple of different prides, and we went back in the vehicle, and I got great photos of this male who was collared and... Mm. We just saw so many lions that trip. Um, but Botswana is, um, the way they operate is there's a base camp. Basically think of a, a lodge or a, a hotel. Okay. And we would, the horses are stabled in a barn at night. And we'd ride out every day and explore the area around the camp each day going in a different direction. So that's one style that you can have there. Um, what we do in Kenya is quite different. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So, so this trip was fantastic, and we loved it, and we got home, and Mary's like, okay, shall we do it again? And I'm like, sure. And so the next year was 99, and we got another group together, and I brought Joyce Harmon with me, uh, Dr. Joyce Harmon, and we were bringing in, um, they, they needed, I mean, it's so hard to get stuff in Kenya, or in Africa at all for horses. The duty is really, really high, and oh. it's just hard to get good stuff. So we packed our bags. We took, I don't know how many of the wool felt pads, Western wool felt pads. I think we had like 10 of them. We took uh, my dressage saddle. Joyce brought her computer saddle fit pad, you know, the pressure pad. Yeah. Her, thermog her thermography camera. And we had two laptops. We had like $40,000 worth of research equipment for this. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> to run into a Pride Alliance. <laughs> We flew through Joburg, Johannesburg, and mm. we got to Joburg, and it was like, they were like, you know, uh, we're like, oh, crap, are they going to give us a hard time with all our equipment? All right. um, and there was this little moment going through customs, and it was like, okay, okay, we got in. And then we flew from there, and we went up to um, to Victoria Falls, which is in Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. and the year from the time when I was in Victoria Falls in 98 to 99, in 98, we went to the falls, and we were in the little town, and all the people are smiling, and everything was great. In 99, we got off the plane. There's a guy with a machine gun. It's $50 U.S. to get in. So that was when Ooh. Gabi, who actually, they just had a coup <laughs> in Zimbabwe, um, like yesterday. Oh, um, oh, oh. Yeah, Mugabe got into office, and um, and there was a huge shift in Zimbabwe, um, and... It was uh, not a good shift. Zimbabwe used to be the breadbasket of, of Africa. They used to raise incredible beef and and um, food, and they would uh, make clothing. Like there was a 20 degrees south with a clothing line. And in just a year, there was this huge shift. Um, and then it was, you know, we we're like, okay, we're going to stay at Victoria Falls Hotel. And Victoria Falls Hotel, because we, we had all this research, but we didn't just want to stay anywhere. Um, it, it is the most beautiful British grand hotel Africa, you know, that you could possibly imagine. 
huge uh, campus, the big spiraling staircases up with all the mounts all the way up the stairs. Wow. And high tea and a, and a view of the Victoria Falls. It was amazing, you know, like, because there's a bridge that goes over the falls there, both from Zimbabwe to Zambia. Okay. Uh, so we stayed there that night. Um, with all our research equipment, because we're like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we flew out to Mound, which is in Botswana, and went out on the to the Delta. And the reason that we went early is that we went there to work on the horses. And Joyce did chiropractic and acupuncture, and I did training. And we were just, we actually did collect data, which we never analyzed yet again. Oh, no um, way. <laughs> but we, you know, to see how much how much can just chiropractic and acupuncture do, mm -hmm. and how much is it important to have training? And and in the end, I'm pretty sure our conclusion was you need the training to reinforce the chiropractic and acupuncture. Mm, sure. Um, but while we were there, so we came in this week early. We had the two week safari, and we came in a week early, and we're doing all this. And and. In the Delta, it's quite amazing, actually. There's huge quadrants of land that are por portioned off to the different camps, and you're only allowed so many people in a quadrant. I'm talking hectares mm. um, it, at a time. Well, the neighboring camp was the Elephant Back Safari Camp, and they actually have people ride African elephants, and they were having wow. a problem with the saddle on one elephant. So they asked us to come over and saddle fit an elephant. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. So did you take all the research equipment over to do that? The, the, we did. Did we you? We packed it all up, and they drove us over there, and we got there, and Joyce pulls out her computer saddle pad, and the next, she opens the laptop, and it's dead. <gasps> no way. No, yeah, it's dead. I have the best. I found it the other day. I gotta find it again. I have this fabulous photo of the guy sitting behind the head of the elephant. He's sitting on this elephant with the trunk coming down and the front legs. So you have this, you know, gap between the front legs and the head and the trunk. Uh -huh. And then through that gap, I have Joyce with the manager and the crew all staring at her little computer trying to fix it. Oh no. <laughs> Oh no! Which, which we did not manage to succeed at. Oh. Um, but then I was wandering around and I walk over to the elephant saddle, the one that they were having the problem with, and I'm like looking at this saddle, and it's this wood A-frame, mm -hmm. and it had a pad. And mm -hmm. so I take the pad and I peel it back, and there's a bolt. It's like a three-quarter inch bolt sticking down with through a open cell phone pad. Oh. And I'm like. Do you think this could be the problem? Well, that's um, a fairly simple fix, isn't it? Yeah, so I pointed this out to the crew. I'm like, uh, I think this could be your problem. <laughs> no and need for thought, computers after all. Yep, and so what What happened next was they saddled up the elephants, and Joyce and I climbed up on this one that was having the problem, and he was obviously, I mean, you could feel the asymmetry in his gait as he was walking. Hmm. And a woman take fo took photographs of us, which we never got, so I have zero proof of riding an elephant. Oh. But we rode him back to the camp, and then we took the saddle off, and we used the thermo thermography camera to look at the heat signatures and see what was going on. Nice. Um, yeah, but you know, the best use of thermography cameras in Africa is to go game spotting at night. Oh, I'm sure it is. <laughs> I'm sure it is. Yeah. So when we got back to our camp, one of the nights we went out game spotting and we took the thermography camera and we could find the bush babies in the trees really easy. Oh, how cute. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that was great. <laughs> so, so that was the, the two times that I went to Botswana with Mary and Mary Robinson. And um, we got all of our equipment in and out. We never had a problem with that. Which Good. Was great. Good. And came home. And then Mary kind of went silent for a while, and um, she wound up moving from Alaska to, to Oregon, to Medford, Oregon. And what year was it? Uh, it was like around 2007. She, she contacted me and asked me to come out and do a clinic. So I flew out to Oregon, and I walk into her house, and it's just chock-a-block full with Africa pictures and furniture and books and China and I'm like oh my god I'm back <laughs> and, uh, 
she she she's such a smart lady because she she knew if she brought me out for a clinic and I saw all that she'd be able to get me to go on another safari. Ah, <laughs> gotcha. There was there was a plan with all of that, a secondary totally. plan. Mary's a, Mary's a very shrewd woman. <laughs> so, uh, so I walk in and the next thing we're talking about, oh, let's go back on safari. And she's like, she had wanted me to go to Kenya after Botswana, but we never got that together. And so she started talking about um, Kenya. And if anybody has ever read the book Out of Africa, mm -hmm. it's it's a beautifully written book. And if you if you don't have the time to read, just get it, download it. I, I have it on my iBook, um, my audio books, and I play that when I'm driving. And the woman who reads that book has a perfect British accent, and it's so beautiful, that book. That's awesome. Yeah, so I, I'm... I'm sitting there and we start to talk about going to Kenya on safari and I'm, and she starts working on me. And then I went to get another clinic in um, Eastern Washington and I mentioned it to um, my organizers, this a couple, and they were like, oh yeah, we want to go. And then I mentioned it to somebody else. And then the next person I started talking to, I was in her house and she had this book called um, West with the Night by Beryl Markham. And Beryl used to be a bush flight pilot during the time of, of Karen von Blixen. It's another excellent book called West with the West with the Is it West with the Wind? West with the Night. I don't know about, mm. But it's Beryl Markham and it's her okay. it's her memoirs. Um, oh. and she was there at the same time as um, uh, the von Blixens and, and Finch Haddon, Dennis Finch Haddon, who is Mer uh, who is Robert Redford or Meryl Streep's lover in the movie Out of Africa, mm. which actually were real people. Okay, okay, gotcha. So all these signs, and my friend was having Out of Africa movie playing on the TV. <laughs> what, what, totally like, set the mood, right? Oh my God, I'm like, <laughs> You're, I'm in it. And she's like, you want to go to Africa? She's like, yeah. So the next thing I know. <laughs> How could you say no at that point? You had all those subliminal messages, you know, oh, yeah. pushing and in. You, you, were, you were already committed before she asked. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, so she she you know lasted me in again, and we put a group together, and um, it was a fabulous group, and we went in two thousand eight. Well, we all flew out. We so what you do is you fly to Nairobi internationally, and some of them stopped along the way, and we got out to Nairobi, and at that time we actually drove out to the Mara, which is about a six hour drive. Got in the vehicles and drove out to the Mara, and had this phenomenal safari, and then. When we got back to Nairobi, it was on my, so my birthday is September 17th, and I wanted to be on safari for my birthday, so we arranged that, and we got back to Nairobi after, um, which was after my birthday, and found out the stock market had crashed, and <laughs> it, it crashed on my birthday. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, that 2008 crash, and some of the people, their banks were closed. Shut. Their banks were gone. Oh. Um, so that was a little bit of a drama, but they, it all worked out. Um, okay. But we, you know, I mean, that was my first trip to Safari was in 2008 when the market crashed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Brad and I, we flew back to um, London and then from London came home and um, that's kind of, but anyways, um, since 2008, I have been out there. I've gone on Safari seven times to Kenya. To the same company with the same folks because they are so amazing. It's Safari's so, so Unlimited, and they're an amazing outfitter, and they've become family to us, to Brad and I. So that's it's, great. Like, yeah, that's really neat. That's going um, so many times with the same crew. I'm sure you guys have have become friends and really gotten to know each other a lot. Oh yeah, the crews like literally like um, they said to us when we left in two thousand eight. They said, "Now that you've been here, you are a part of our family." And you know, in the West, somebody says that, and it's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Well, when we went back on our next safari in two thousand ten, Brad and I got out of the vehicle, and we w felt more like home with our family than our families. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, wow. it was amazing. It was just, it was so joyful and. It was so fabulous to see everybody. Um, they remembered the guests we brought the first time. They knew our names, and it's you know it's so hard to describe um, 
the, the people in Kenya and the crew, they're different. They're from different tribes. There's, I think, 42 different tribes in Kenya. Um, but how um, genuinely, honestly happy they are to see you. And, and they, you know, when they say something, it's not, they mean it. That's coming from the heart. They're so lovely. And they, um, Gordy Church is the guy who owns Safaris Unlimited. And his dad, Tony, started the company in 1971. And Mary had been there in 75. She'd ridden with them in the past, back in the 70s. And so that's why she wanted to get me back there, because she wanted to I go see. There. Okay. Yep. Okay. So she knew them well. She knew Gordy from when he was a... Uh, well, in 70, he's 40 something now. Um, you know, I mean, she's like, Mama Safari is what they call Mary when we got there. <laughs> and Mary's hysterically funny because she's like, This is my last safari. I'm not going to come back. And then the next year, this is my last. Her whole family, Mary's family, knows that it's, This is my last safari means nothing. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> So she's uh, she's actually been out there since she said it was her last part of me. But oh, that's funny. That's yeah. funny. Just can't quit. Yeah. Nope. She's she's uh, a lifer. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, with with the kind of crew, it sounds like you've got there, and and with that feeling, like you said, of feeling like you're going home, that would it would be hard to turn down going. Yeah, and it's you know there's there's different kinds of safaris and. Um, you know, like Botswana was from a base camp, and there's the lodges out in Kenya. But um, what when you talk about true safari, what what does that mean? Like, what was the safari like back in the 1800s? Mm -hmm. And and what it was is that you went out with your crew, and you and your crew went on an adventure, and it was uh, um, canvas. It's mobile tented canvas camp. So, um, Gordy. Is and he's just replaced all his tents this year. We got there, and it's all brand new tents. He keeps investing back into his company because he wants to maintain that true safari feel. Mm. And it is real. Um, and so, what true safari is is that it's safari's journey, and mm -hmm. you gather together this group of people. Then that's what I do. I collect a group of people to come with me, and we all go to Kenya, and we meet up in the hotel the night before we go out, and we have our our meet and greet dinner, and uh, everybody gets to meet everybody. And then the next morning, we get up and we get in the vehicles, and we go to the airport, and we fly out to the Mara. And for the next nine days, we are a little family unit, and we need to rely on each other to keep everybody safe mm. we we have to support each other to make sure everybody's coming forward with us and we travel as this little um group of people across the most amazing country where you don't go through over a you know it's only a dirt road if you cross the road there is not a fence there's not a gate you you know there's no towns everything that you have with you you have packed out with you in the vehicles before you got there there's more crew than guests. Like we had 13 guests and 20, 20 to 25 crew. Wow. And they pack out all the hay for the horses, all the food for the people. We have whipped cream and, uh, you know, I mean, we, I mean, the meals are gourmet meals. It's incredible. And, and we travel across, we'll travel a couple hundred kilometers in the nine days of, through this amazing countryside. Um, and so, Safari really is journey, and we go out there, and we're in tented camps, beautiful stand-up tents with double beds for for couples, and cow skin on the floor, and you're you're woken up in the morning. Somebody comes to your tent, and they go, "Jumbo, coffee <laughs> or tea?" And they serve you coffee and tea in bed. Wow! Wow! And they bring you a biscuit. You can have cream and sugar. And then, and then, the next crewman comes by and it's like, Jumbo, hot water for your face. And they pour hot water into these basins. So you have a you have a commode and they pour the hot water into your basins. You have a mirror. You go out and you, you know, wash your face with lovely warm water and you get dressed and you walk down to the breakfast table and if it's a morning ride, there's toast and jam and honey and peanut butter and Nutella, you know, it's the British fare and the marmite, marmite or, you know, no Vegemite. 
with Marma. Gotcha. And you have your piece of toast and your cup of coffee and your saddlebag and you walk out to the picket line and your horse is already tacked up and waiting for you. And everybody takes their horses and walks away from the picket line and then gets all organized and we all mount up using a rock or a stump or a bucket, whatever, just to get on our horses. <laughs> And we ride out into this just amazing land, and you're as you're riding along. There's a trough. Oh yeah. Oh wow. You know. And, really. And giraffes, oh yeah. I mean, literally. There's a giraffe, and there's a herd of zebra, and oh, a water buck, and you know, riding along, just uh, you know, seeing what. And there's a papa hyena over there, or. Cape Buffalo, or of course the elephants, and we come across the elephants, and and um, and you ride out, and you just explore. You go down, like we camp along the Mara River, and there's a lot of hippo, and we ride down along the bank of the river, and we just see what's is anybody down there taking a drink, or you know who's who's crossing, or who's coming by, and then up around another little, uh, you know. Um, little swell in the ground and you come up and there's, you know, uh, literally 25 giraffe right there. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yep. And then we, we, and you'll see secretary birds, which are these really tall birds with these big feathers that stick up on their heads mm -hmm. and secretary birds and lilac breasted rollers. And, uh, you know, you might come up on a, um, a silverback jackal. And uh, maybe they have some babies or some little tiny warthogs. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's so much fun. And we just, um, on, on camp days that we're not moving, we explore the area and we ride around and we, like, just, you know, see what we can find over here and what's over there. And Gordy leads us around and we'll go for a canter or a long trot. And um, you don't want to move at speed all the time because you'll miss it. You know, it's right. It's sure, nice. I would imagine. And, and unlike being in a vehicle, I mean, you are right there in the environment. You're right there on horseback, and it's just it's. I don't. I don't know that I could ever do a vehicle safari after doing horseback safari. Oh, so. I bet. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And then we come back to camp, and you know, it's like okay, everybody, you know. Just go and get a drink or whatever. Get your water bottles. And we saw those lying over there. Let's go back and find them in the vehicles. And we all jump in the vehicles and drive out and explore some more. And, and then we come back and have a delicious lunch. I mean, the food is, like, amazing. They, I mean, they bake focaccia and soups and, yeah, um, great food. It's all cooked on a, on a um, uh, they have a charcoal uh, stove, a, a oven, you know, oh, okay. a charcoal oven and an open fire. Wow. Everybody, yeah. Wow. And they they want you to fully immerse yourself in the experience. So you're welcome to go anywhere in the camp, go talk to the crew, go talk to the people at the mess tent or the ones doing your laundry or you know, go over and talk to the sizes who are taking care of the horses and and just really be part of this incredible family of of people from all different places. You know, we have people from all over come on our safaris and um and just really be with the land. And then we have lunch and we take a nap. <laughs> That's like from for about two hours. <laughs> um, Whoa. Yeah, because it gets, you know, so so people say, well, how hot is it in Africa? Mm, yeah. we're, we're at 5,500 feet on the morrow. We're at altitude. Okay. So it's like dry. I mean, it's like 80 degrees, 80, 82 degrees. It was actually nicer there this trip than it was at my house in Virginia. It was actually like uh, high 70s, low 80s, and um, at mm -hmm. night it can get chilly. It, you might need a jacket or something, um, but there's more mosquitoes at my house in Virginia than I've seen on safari, okay? I mean, Well, you've got a big difference homes. in the humidity there too, right? Yeah, it's dry yeah, yeah. Um, because of the altitude, mm -hmm. and this, this year we, we swam across the Mara River with the horses and went up on what's called the escarpment, so we were up at about 6,000 feet by the time we were at the top. Wow. So, you know, it's like the climate is delightful. In the mid-afternoon, it gets hot, and everybody, including all the animals, goes and takes siesta for a couple hours. I don't know. They all just <laughs> kind of settle down. And then in the evening, we come and we have tea and cookies, and we, you can either go for a game drive, or you can go for a walk, or you can go for a ride when we're in camp on those days. Um, 
So we'll go out in the evening, we'll go out for a little game drive, and that that elephant um, video that I just sent you. Mm, yeah, yeah. That, we went out for a game drive because we had um, seen some lion. And so I think somebody saw it in the vehicle. Yeah, at, in the afternoon. And so we went back in the evening, and we found these four lionesses, and they were getting ready to hunt. And, um, and they were going to hunt these wildebeest, herds of wildebeest, because in September when we go, it's the Great Migration, which is the largest land animal migration in the world. Yes, right, right. 1.5 million wildebeest travel. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so they're like little gumdrops dotted all over the landscape. I'll bet. You, watch them, you know, it's made. So these lions were thinking about dinner, and it was starting to rain a little bit. And when it rains, the wildebeest turn their butt to the rain, and which kind of sets them up for the lions. Mm -hmm. And so the lions were thinking about dinner, and then the hyena went and blew it for them. The hyena. <laughs> <laughs> Those damn hyena. <laughs> oh, yeah, they blew it. They went around the other side, and the, all the little beasts went, oh, wait, wait, there's hyena. And the lion went, oh, oh whatever. Gotcha. <laughs> so we were driving back when we found that elephant that was down in the river, in the dry bed, riverbed, and came up and hooted at our truck <laughs> yeah hooted at your truck well i'm gonna i'm gonna see what we can do to try to play this so for okay. everybody who's tuning in i'm gonna play a little video clip i'm not sure if it's gonna go through so if you're listening this will this will be a great little test for future broadcasts also so if you're if you're listening in let me know if you hear the audio now coming through this video that wendy sent me No. Either they're enthralled with the sound and they can't type or it's not going through. No, okay, no. so Kendra says she doesn't hear anything, so it must not have gone through. Well, no. bummer. I'll, I'll post it. I'll post it up on my page or uh, on the comments on this so they can hear it. Awesome. Okay, yeah, we'll find a way to share this with you guys because it's it's really awesome, this little video, and maybe I can even share it. Maybe I can find a way to share it in the comments uh, yeah, after we're done here. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. So, so there's, he was, he's a teenage bull. He's probably about 15 years old, and he came up out of the ravine, and so they, the, there was two vehicles, and the one in front of us started their engine, and he was like, oh, what's that? And he, they don't have good eyesight, and it was kind of dusk. And so the vehicle pulled off a little bit to get out, you know, to move away from him, and he backs up like, hmm, I, I think I might have to let you know how big I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be safe. Yep, yep, and he trumpets, and then the vehicle doesn't really run away, so he's really rather confused, and then he's like, I'm just going to ignore you now. I'm just going to go back and eat this tree. <laughs> so, yeah, it's really, really cute. Uh, and it is a great little video, gang, so I'm going to do my best to get that loaded up here so that you can see it once we're done with our conversation, So, because yep. uh, it, it's a great one to watch. So it's just a really amazing place, and, and one of the things about going on safari is that you peel away all the facades and all the unnecessary, and you get back. Brad always says, the Mara knows what you need and mm -hmm. and is there for you. And so you get out there, and it's so, I, I don't even know how to describe it. Gordy always calls it magical. But it's so real that all the trappings that we carry around with us every day just fall away. And you get into a rhythm of, of the land, and it's we're right near the equator, so the light's twelve twelve. It's twelve dark, twelve light. Okay. You know, and you and you wake up to the sunrise, and you and the when the sun sets, it's like boom, it's dark. Um, and we have dinner in the evening, and in our tented uh, mess tent, and um, it's a candlelight, and you know, I mean, it's just it's just beautiful. And I'm I'm kind of liking the sound of the rhythm you're talking about. Morning tea to wake you up and gourmet <laughs> meals and an afternoon nap and candlelight dinner. I think I could get used to that rhythm of life. Yeah, I think you're yeah, right. No, absolutely. <laughs> it's like, can we do this every day? Right. <laughs> um, and, and, it, and you get, and the people are so amazing. And so, so one of the times when we moved tent, and this is just to give you an idea of how meticulous the crew is, you know what a goldfish cracker looks like? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so one of our guests left a goldfish cracker on her bedside table. The crew broke down the entire camp, and we're talking all in all the tents. And when you have, you know, 
12 to 15 guests, you can, you know, there's a lot of tents for the guests, never mind the crew, right? Oh, right, yeah, because you said you have more crew than more crew than guests. Crew. Wow, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so you've got a little a little city, a little town here. Yeah. Up. They break it all down, they pack it up, they moved it. When that guest got into their tent, the goldfish cracker was on the bedside table. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they're meticulous. And... Uh, I mean, and they, and they, they are, they are so uh, concerned that you have a good time. I mean, they are genuinely concerned that, like, we had a woman, literally this happened. She lost her iPhone. She was, we had ridden out, we came back to camp, and she lost her iPhone. Now, what are the chances of finding an iPhone in the middle of Africa? Okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> and it turned out her tent mate had a stat phone. And so they tried to use, you know, find my phone to find the phone, but it wasn't G, you know, 4G out there. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So we right. called on the sat phone. We got in the vehicle. We went back to where we had had, um, we had had uh, Bloody Marys and <laughs> snacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, now we're starting to understand how the phone got lost. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. So anyway, we drove back there and we looked for the phone everywhere. We couldn't find it. We get back to camp and Karanja, who is, he's in charge of all the vehicles and everything. He's Karanja. Karanja's been with Gordy since he was a child. And he was, he was wringing his hands. He says, oh, Wendy, Miss Wendy, she's, you know, what are we going to do about this phone? What are we going to do? And he was so genuinely concerned. And it was like, you know, I, I mean, I was trying to console Karanja because my guest lost her phone because she was, you know. And so, but the weirdest thing was another guest was looking for, to find a signal because she needed to make contact, and she found the phone. She found no the way. phone. No way. Wow. Kidding. Needle in a haystack. Incredible. And Karanja was the biggest smile. He was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> Because he, they really, I, 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 they want you to really live in their country and understand the country and the land and the animals and the people and the Maasai, and and you are family and they they really care and it's just the most amazing thing to to be around people that are are genuinely happy and genuinely care for your happiness. Mm. Uh, and I don't know that there's any good way, you know, everyone that's come on safari with us has said, this so exceeds my expectations. That's you, great. Yeah, because you cannot describe what it is like to be in the company of people that truly love, love what they're doing, love the process, love being out there, and it's their way of life. I mean, Gordy is more at home on the Mara than anywhere in the world. Mm. Um, and he's, you know, he's had sex. So on my second safari in 2010, he brought in a groom from England because he needed help with the horses, and that's now his wife. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Felicia came in, and we met Felicia, and so it was her first safari out on the Mara with Gordy, um, with my group. <laughs> And we watched all the sparks fly, and um, they try to tell us it happened later, but we know. <laughs> <laughs> you were there to witness it. Yeah, absolutely. And now they have a little girl that came on safari with us. She's two years old. She sits on a horse beautifully. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, pictures of her on Sherpa Cut. So we've now become part of their family. That's you know? fantastic. And, and that's what's one of the things that's so special is that it's um, – just, it's really unique. It's really quite, uh, it, like I said, it strips away all the, all the extraneous and all the superficial and, um, and you, you get down to the basics of life. And that's really, Brad's more at peace on, on safari than anywhere in the world. Mm. So It's just real. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other thing, Patrick, that's so interesting is, you know what, over here in, in the horsemanship, you know, this this whole we've we've taken this concept of predator prey to to this extreme. We've drawn it out way too far on its mm. line and and made it too simplistic and black and white. And when you're in Africa, you realize there's so many subtleties in this whole system and this way of life that 99% of the time 
you watch the hyena walk through the zebra and the gazelle and they're going back to their their den and and you watch the lion sitting there sleeping with the giraffe that walks up and looks down and goes what are you guys doing and you know i i have a photograph of a giraffe extending its neck to its absolute limit reaching up for the leaves on the acacia tree with the hyena sitting at its feet and wow and so you you start to realize that that we uh really miss you know misused in a way this concept and that we've taken it a bit overboard yes yeah. and you know who's the, the prey out there us <laughs> mm, yeah yeah you, know, you ride up on a lion on a horse and you're like uh huh right you know? so so it's a very fluid thing and it's not this black and white and it's not this you know like like there's there's a, a and there's a sense of of uh, I don't know flow or something and then of course somebody gets hungry right mm, yeah and, sure and the, and now when somebody gets hungry it's like okay and you'll see everybody go oh they're hunting oh but they typically take out the weak and infirm mm -hmm. right or the young mm -hmm. I mean they're gonna take well out sure the, the, the easiest people. ones to get sure right and so and then you see the flip side where the Cape Buffalo chases the lion and flips it over and, and literally, yeah, literally takes its horns and flips it. So, or, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of even the zebra will get aggressive. And so it's, it's, we just, I don't know. It's kind of like what we do, I guess, is we take a, an idea that's actually very nuanced and complex and try to distill mm. it down into a black and white situation. Right. And that's, when you're out there, you realize that's so not how it works. <laughs> gotcha. You know? Gotcha. Well, yeah. and it sounds like uh, the way you're talking about the distance and the, the span and the space and the, the picture in my mind is that, you know, when you say we're the prey out there, uh, you could be by the sound of it, as much prey to the elements as you would be to the predators. Absolutely. You know, which I guess would make sense for then how they carry out their relationship as well. Yeah. And, you know. and you know, the Maasai live on the land and they're nomadic. They're less nomadic now than they used to be, but the Maasai live on that land and they're, you know, they raise cattle and, and, and one of the beautiful things that I've seen change in the 10 years I've been going, um, is how they have formed these conservancies so that the Maasai value the wildlife. Mm. And so, you know, if before you have a manata in the middle of, the, of their land and it'd be kind of, there'd be a lot of trash and flies and from all the cattle and, and the game was pushed back. And tourism, they've recognized the value of tourism because it brings them dollars. So there's a large chunk of the, of the safari fees that actually goes to the Maasai for being on their land. We're camping on their land. Okay. Um, and they made these arrangements through these different conservancy companies that they're guaranteed a certain amount of income every year, regardless of the number of guests. So these companies like Safaris and Limited that made a commitment to the Maasai. And in return, they get to use the Maasai's land. Gotcha. And since they started this, I think it was like 2010, maybe a little later, What's so interesting is how everyone has prospered. That the manya has been pulled back. The game has tripled since I first went there. Um, we wow. saw 25 lion. We saw cheetah. We see. I've seen leopard. I've seen you know herds of of elephant and herds of giraffe and you know it's really really come back. And at the same time, the Maasai benefit because there's better land management and they graze selectively mm. grazing their cattle in different places. And they have portable bomas now. Boma is where they put the cattle at night. Mm -hmm. And now they have, it looks like sort of uh, uh, round pen on steroids. <laughs> but metal, metal paneled bomas, which even in the two, three years ago, they didn't have. But so they can be with their cattle as they're grazing them selectively along in different places. And then they brought their cattle down to the river and here's the hippo standing on the side of the river and all the cattle coming down and getting a drink and everybody's co you know, coexisting peacefully. Wow. So this, this land management company that's in Mara North and the Mara Triangle has really, I can't remember the, the name of the, the guy that's in charge of it, but 
done a beautiful job of management to, and they have rangers, they police it, they patrol it, they, you know, work on anti-poaching. Um, the Sheldrake Elephant Orphanage comes in if there's a, they find a baby elephant, they have a plane now, they can fly up, pick that baby up, get it fluids, get it into a good environment. Um, so there's so much going on that's really positive in the management of at least certain areas of the Mara and the, how that's brought the game back and, and everybody's prospering because the Maasai own that land, they could turn around and sell it. It's not mm. protected in, you know, in the, it's not under government protection, it's Maasai land. Okay. And as the Maasai benefit from the tourism and they value the animals, the animals then flourish and if, say, a lion takes down a cow, they'll get reimbursed. So they're not not out that money gotcha. and they're not looking to get rid of the lion because it killed their cattle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's another area called the, the reserve where this management style is not in place yet. And it's, you know, there was all these little tourist buses and they were getting in the way of the wildebeest when they were crossing the river and, um, Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's, the, there's not nearly the organization with the reserve yeah. that there is with the Mara. In the Mara North and the triangle where we are. Okay. And, you know, this is Gordy, Gordy's family, the Gordy's family who started this Safari so Unlimited. His father, Tony, started the company in 71, but the church family has been in Kenya for, since 1929. And they've always done things to, that would help benefit Kenya and, and the overall um, environment. So one of the things that one of the relatives, church relatives did was they, they there's an area called the Aberdeers and there were white rhino, I think it was white, there was rhino in there. And they worked really hard to be able to fence it off and protect the Aberdeers thinking they were protecting the rhino. And it turned out they were protecting the watershed. And so uh -huh. these are the kinds of things that the church family, um, another one of the churches, she was a, 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 a uh, research scientist out in the Indian Ocean, studied turtles, and she saw these kids collecting flip flops and making keychains out of them. And she wound up turning it into a company that's called Ocean Soul. There's over, I think it was, I think it's like 400 people that they hire now, and they clean up the Indian Ocean. They pick up all the flip flops, they bring it in, they wash them, they glue them together, and they carve animals out of them. And so they oh, wow. recycle. Yeah, it's cool. So when we go into Nairobi on day one, I always take people on shopping safari, and that's one of the places we go because it's here's where we can see how something that someone's trash can be turned into a treasure and clean up the environment and employ people all in one cycle. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so there's some really good things happening in Kenya. There's a, a strong middle class coming in, and they recognize how important tourism is to their economy. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, there's so much pressure uh, from from outside on on land, and um, so much pressure on the animals. From you know, I mean, there's no formal hunting in Kenya, but there is poaching. Um, and for a while, the poaching was really, really bad. And so, like when I went in 2012 to 2015. The poaching just escalated out of control, um, but they've been working on it, and now it's it's decreasing again, and it, they're getting it under control, and they they have patrols, and there's rangers, and they're really working hard to value the the natural resources and to protect them so that they preserve them for the future. And um, you know, so it's just it's it's just a, it's a really fast fascinating thing but you know there's a lot of pressure on it and um uh you know there was that's kind of a sad story but when my first was going my first couple of years there was an elephant there whose tusks were so long that they nearly crossed okay and, and i have photographs of him and then the next safari when i went back he had been shot and he died in the river he was because they were poaching and they didn't get his tusks but they were 100 pounds a piece Wow. So, yeah, he was. There's these old, these old bulls, and they're all named, and they're they're national treasures. And so, you know, there's these pressures of the outside world uh, trying to come in, but 
there's there's pockets of good and pockets of people really committed to like the shell deck animal elephant, animal orphanage to to you know helping and and restoring and preserving and so you know it's really um how did i get there i guess you know because part of, conserve, part of your fees when you go and run a safari go to the maasai so that there's value in the wildlife that there's mm -hmm. value in the game and there's value in preserving the land and uh you know kind of pushing back on those pressures that want to come in they, uh, for a while there, they wanted to build a road across the Serengeti for the Chinese to get to a, a town of 100,000 people. Now, you know it wasn't 100,000 people they cared about. It was the, the uh, minerals. Right. And had they put that road in, they would have interrupted the largest land animal migration in the world. They would have interrupted the wildebeest migration. Wow. And there was enough tourism pressure from enough different places that they didn't do it, which was amazing. That's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, there's a lot of people working really, really hard, um, and typically it's the ones you never hear about <laughs> Yeah. to, you know, preserve and sustain the environment and sustain the wildlife and sustain, uh, uh, you know, help support a way of living that, and, and it's not, you know, nothing's perfect, but to keep the, it from, you know, losing this treasure that's just so incredible. Wow. So, you know, I, I say that because um, it looks like our government's actually going to allow people to bring trophy ivory back right. into the United States. Right. right, and that was just released, what, today or yesterday? They yesterday, just released and the I'm news just on that. like, Ugh, you know, um, so, I mean, it's this, there's this constant pressure on the system, and mm -hmm. so if anybody's ever had thoughts of going to Africa, you know, it's one of those things that's like, I know right now Kenya is doing a lot to preserve the environment and preserve the Mara, um, and we just have to keep hoping that that continues, um, and that the migration, because the migration is just phenomenal. I mean, every time I've gone in September, the migration, it's a migration, so they're not always in the same place. <laughs> right, sure, sure. Um, we picture we picture the Discovery Channel where they've got the shots of every all of everybody moving and, and everything being clustered together, but that's surely not the way it takes place. No, there's times when that happens. Mm -hmm. um, like if they're going to cross the river, we watch them all go down the river and they're all kind of wondering, and then they start to cross. And there's times when there's little groups here and little groups there, or when they look like little black dots scattered across this plain that's as wide as you can see. Wow. Um, and there's times like I've gone and it's been like a feedlot, like literally like a feedlot. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I mean, but that's the beauty of it is that you, you never walk across the same footprints. You never walk, you know, ever in the same exact path. And if you follow the game wherever they are, that's where we go and seek out the game. And this time we drove the vehicles all the way down to the Tanzania border to look for the migration because they weren't where we were, but they came back because the rains came, you know, it's like, oh, rain. right, yeah. Yeah, so the rain, they follow the grass, it rains, and they, I, they, obviously they must smell it or something, and then they all start to canter away, hmm. you know, one after the other, and there they go, and then they stop, and they graze, and then they walk, and then somebody lays down, you know, or somebody plays. I mean, it's just. That would be such an interesting dynamic to watch. Yeah. 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 So it's really quite, quite a, it was, so what you have to realize is this was never on my bucket list. I didn't have Africa on my bucket list. Really? Uh, no, Mary can run me into it. And then <laughs> in 2000, I don't know, 10 or 12, she decided to retire and sell the company and Gordy and Mary plotted against me and decided I was buying it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's funny that you come full circle like this. It's good that you did because Brad uh, is listening in and he sent in a, uh, a little message asking you to describe a little bit about how you acquired Horsing Around International. Uh, yeah, so so, um, so Mary was, she has some health issues and she knew she couldn't keep going and she's <laughs> older. And so, you know, I've been with her, I think two or three, I think, I think it was after the second safari, Mary and Gordy got together and decided that I was the one who was going to continue horsing around international. And so they plotted and planned. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm 
buying a company that I had no intention of. <laughs> it sounds like she's really good at planning and talking people into things. Oh, Mary's amazing. <laughs> And when she gets her teeth on the bit, you cannot get it out of her mouth. <laughs> yeah. So, so Mary, she decided, and, and the together they they made an arrangement where I couldn't refuse it. And uh, so it's you know Mary's always in our hearts when we're on safari. And um, that's fantastic. Yeah. So we've been. I've been seven times. Brad's been five times. Um, we're going again this coming September, September 2018. And okay. the reason we're, we're going now is because this year I had Equin, Equitana in Essen, Germany, and Safari right. in the same year. Right. And I've done that twice. And it's just like uh, Equitana is like a safari in itself, a completely different kind of safari, but mm -hmm. it's like safari. It's nine days. And I just want to get them on the off years. So safari gotcha. is going to be the even number years. And Equitana is, I can't move Equitana. It's always on the odd years. Um, so we're going back in September 2018. We've got some slots left. We'd love to have anybody listening that wants to go join us. Awesome. Um, that that's a question that has come in at least once so far from the listeners is how to how do we sign up for that? They can email me at wendy at wendymurdoch.com or um, you know message me through Facebook or uh, yeah. Uh, and I'll put, I can put up my, my information there, or maybe you can put Perfect. it in in the comments. Yep, definitely. I will definitely do that. That's awesome. Yep, or, so, and then you can go on my website and find information about Safari on my website. Awesome, awesome. And you've got you've got quite a few photos on there also, don't you? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I You know, I have not had a chance to put up my pictures from this past Safari because I haven't been home, and I mm. took them with a camera that doesn't have SD cards, so... I have some uh, camera equipment, um, but I have some fabulous pictures in that elephant recording, which I just love. Yeah, um, I gotta get that up there, and the picture of the giraffe with the hyena. I need to get up there, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I can get that done in the next couple weeks. Awesome, um, awesome, very yeah. cool. I look forward to those for sure. Um, so, what, what are the horses like? That, that you're oh, riding out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and, and all of this is so fascinating. I could listen to all of this forever. Um, but, yeah, what are the horses like? The, the horses are great. The horses are a mixture of thoroughbreds, Somali pony, um, boa ped, which is a South African breed. And now they've got a Frisian boa ped cross, and they've got a warm blood. Uh, what is Capillion? Some warm blood, so they've got some bigger horses now, okay. um, and they've got a bunch of thoroughbreds off the track that wind up absolutely loving being in a herd going across the mara. Oh, but they do, yeah. Yeah, so they have horses of of, of different personalities and and um different uh, size. The sizes are all around, you know, sixteen hands, roughly maybe fifteen three, and then Capillion I think is a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, well, they, they need win. to be pretty substantial to to manage out there, yeah. Um, well, there's, like I said, you need a variety, just like anything, because you get some smaller people and some bigger people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so Gordy and Flip, they know their horses so well. One of the things that always amazes me is that get there, they talk to my guests, and they know their horses so well. They match them up, and they, they nail it every time. Oh, I mean, that's cool. They nail the combos. And um, the horses, when they're at home, because they're not on safari all the time, live out in a, it's a huge, I think it's like 5,000 acres or something. I'm not quite sure, but it's a really big place. And they have all the game except for lion. So they're exposed to elephants mm. and giraffes and okay. rabies. And they live with them. And then they come in every day. Um, and then, you know, they're trucked out to the Mara, and they live on a pit line at night and they have Maasai guards with them all the time at night with the fires to just make sure everybody stays safe mm -hmm. um, and they're you know it's really interesting to see how the horses operate as a herd and, um, and have their places and their personalities they're allowed to have their individual personalities um, and the care is you know Flick is uh, Felicia is amazing and she's she uh, does bowing. She does bowing on the horses, and they use surefoot on the horses. We've got I've got lots of pictures of the safari horses on pad. Awesome. Yep, and uh, homeopathics because it's really I mean trying to get a doctor out there is. Oh sure, doctor, right, right, right. And a farrier, they fly, I think they fly their farrier up from South Africa. Well, they have a, one of the crew does the horses' feet. 
okay. on a regular basis, and then they bring in somebody once in a while, as a, you know, kind of just to see how it's going on. So wow. um, it's not easy to keep horses in Africa. It's actually a, a luxury because there's a lot of diseases and things that are unique to Africa, mm -hmm. and just you know the the climate. Um, so it really you really have to stay on top of your horses to keep them well, and they do an amazing job. Um, they're, they're so funny because they're blanketed at night and they get chilly. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, chilly, I'm, I'm finally not hot. And right. You know? And the Mosca is so funny because the Mosca guards, like, it'll get to be like 65 and they'll have heavy coats and hat and hats on. And you're like, are you kidding? Wow, wow. <laughs> Just so really different than what they're, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, but they really, they um, really care for their horses. And they're, you know, we always toast the horses. I mean, they're the mm -hmm. ones that are carrying it across the market. For sure. Yeah. Wow. So, wow. so what kind of riders sign up? Um, we need riders that are capable of a strong canner, um, and that's a safety factor. So right, because you, know, you told me you go out galloping across the, yeah, across um, the land. Across the plain. But really, the, the rider ability level for this type of safari, um, you need to be a, a fairly strong rider and, and be able to do a strong camera for sure. Um, because, like, it's, it, well, we were, we were riding along, and there was an elephant. She had her baby, and the baby was rather far away from Mama. And mm -hmm. then she saw us, and she saw, and her baby went running over, and she put out her, she didn't charge us, but we were all very ready, mm -hmm. you know. So I mean, it's quite, I have a picture for that, and I can post that too. It's not, awesome. Gordy's really, really careful. He never, he always makes sure you have a good experience, and he does it. And he never puts you in a position where you cannot get get out. In other mm -hmm. words, he's not going to take a risk that is uh, a dangerous risk. Um, he he has so good at reading. I mean, he's been out there since he was five years old. He's so good at reading his horses, his guests, and the game. And believe me, he's like, we were riding along one day, and he stops and gets off his horse and puts his arm down, and a chameleon crawls up his sleeve. How saw really? That? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And then he put it on a train and changed color. He changed color to his shirt and changed back. <laughs> so, you know, their, but their ability to see things, it's like, what? Yeah. You just saw a 60 elephant five miles away, or you just spotted that chameleon in the grass. How would you do that? You know? Eyes like a hawk. Wow. Yeah, it's uncanny. Yeah. Um, but he's he's really like I like I said I, I, I've been there seven times and we have had you know wonderful rides and thrilling canners and and everything. But he's really. Um, you know, and sometimes if we need to, we split the group. If there's a group that wants to go slower and a group that wants to go faster, and we can split the group. But you know, it's not a beginner ride. It's not an intermediate ride. It's and we've had a number of people that haven't been ready for our ride, but they okay. made the commitment to come, okay. and then that was the goal. They needed to up their game and be ready to go. Oh, gotcha. Sure, sure. That's the date on their come. calendar that they have to be ready by. Right, and we've got a number of people that have done that that have said, okay, I want to go, I'm not ready yet, and so they put it on the calendar, and then they rose to the challenge, and they got there. And, That's awesome. And it, yeah, and the other thing that we've had some people that have come out, and it's been a bit more than they anticipated, and, you know, we, they, they got through the ride, and they had a great time, and what I told them was, you will not know what this will did for you until you get home. You will not know yeah. what happened. And then I get the email. You're so right. I mean, I feel so like like I stretched to come on this ride, and now I'm such a more confident rider. Like I ride my horse out in Colorado. It's great, no problem. Mm. Because they've done that little stretch out there with us. Right. Right. You know, and of course I'm on the ride. So if there's anybody that needs some help and some pointers and that sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, Perfect. That's there. Perfect. Yeah. What a great chance to, to live that help too for the time being. Yeah. Yep. Uh, awesome. Awesome. That's fantastic. So you were talking about how uh, Gordy does a great job keeping everybody safe, which is good. And that's definitely a good selling point. If anybody is interested, if anybody is listening, but 
Um, do you have a moment uh, or an experience on there that would pop out in your mind as being kind of like the scariest moment you can think of on Safari? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't take you long to think at all. No, no, not at all. <laughs> so we, um, we had ridden past a herd of elephants on our way to our lunch break on move day. So we were moving camp. So the whole, every, all the luggage and everything is packed in the trucks. And, the camps were broken down, and they're at the new place setting it up. And we ride into our lunch spot, beautiful little spot with trees and a little stream. And as we ride in, we pass through, pass this little herd of elephants. Okay, no problem. And we, uh, we, we attack the horses, and then they wash them off and rinse them down and get them a drink of water. And then they tie them to the different trees, and they still can graze because they need to get as many calories as they can in on the ride. Mm -hmm. So they graze at lunchtime. And we have our lunch, and after lunch, People are, you know, sleeping or reading or writing or just kind of hanging out in the cots and the blankets and things that we have. And um, I'm back by the by the little table where we kept lunch. And the next thing I know, I, I hear trumpeting. You know that trumpet sound that I tried to play? Mm. Well, I've heard it once before, but I did not record it. Oh. <laughs> There's a reason I didn't record it. Yeah. So... So they were moving a few of the horses to have them graze in a different spot. And so Gordy and, um, uh, what was it, Clemmy, um, Gordy, Clemmy, and Flick were moving the horses. And, and this elephant decided she wanted to bring her herd in for a drink of water. And she saw Gordy and put her ears in, not out, out, out like warning, in mm -hmm. like not warning, no. dropped her head and charged. No. And as she charged, one person had my horse in hand, and he reared up and veered the, the elephant off. And Cordy's glasses got, sunglasses got stopped. He ran back to the vehicle. The next thing, I'm standing there, and I hear an elephant trumpet and see an elephant charging toward me. <laughs> oh, my. And, and at the same time, I'm watching my guests look like, the, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, 10 pins. Right? And oh, and my left gosh. And and right and all over, and they're jumping the vehicles. And this elephant came into our camp. Two horses went flying past me one direction. Um, I, I mean, I've seen people fly all over the place. Gordy gets in his vehicle, starts to chase the elephant. James gets in his vehicle, goes off to help. Six horses break free and run to the right oh, and no. loop around. And I watch them loop around. We catch the two that went past me. The six, I see them gallop to my right, and then they take a left away from camp, and they're gone. Oh, and my gosh. So we're standing out, and um, Gordy's on the radio, radio at camp. This horses are heading towards Camp radio goes back. This is what he told them. Camp radio goes back. Thank you. And he's joking. Ha, ha, ha. ha. <gasps> and then the next thing, they're, um, they're here. Five minutes later. They're oh, here. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, fortunately, wow. one of the horses that got loose was the lead mare. Uh, and she was so mm. smart. And she led these horses away from the thorn bushes and around the place where the lions live and took them to camp. Wow. Thank goodness. And, thank goodness. And so we're all... We're all like standing there, so everybody was really nervous. We broke out the rescue remedy. We're giving everybody rescue remedy. Right. And Tim, one of our crews there, and he just sent out to, because the attack is all over the place, and I have all these guests that are now a little tweaked. I'm <laughs> sure. Oh, man. And so we had Kip get all the tack, and I just made everybody organize the saddle pads and the bridles and the pads and the blankets. <laughs> and, and the remaining horses, we got them tied fast to trees and close to us. And... Gordy, Gordy had radioed back, and we knew all the horses were in, and they were all okay. Everybody was fine. And he comes back, and <laughs> and we have tea. And then we broke out the Cadbury chocolate. Oh, perfect, perfect. <laughs> that fixes everything. Tea and everything. chocolate. Yeah. Tea and chocolate. Very British. We're all okay. Time for tea and chocolate. <laughs> Perfect. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, that was pretty exciting. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's, we can laugh about it because it ended okay, but that had to be terrifying in the moment. It was pretty startling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. oh, oh, I forgot the, I forgot why she charged him. Okay. So Gordy oh. had just gotten married and gotten a new stock. That's what happened. And so when she was charging, he cracked his stock 
with and she didn't like it and that's what he she charged him ah <laughs> gotcha okay yes he went to veer her off and she said i don't like she, she was a hormonal pregnant mama ah uh, <laughs> mm, yeah never mess with them no, no but, uh, <laughs> of any species but, never mess with them exactly yeah. <laughs> Particularly elephants, but wow, wow. You know, but I, I have to say that seven times I've been there and we've, uh, you know, all, everyone, I stay in touch with my guests and they just excuse about safari. And I, I have one guy, type double A, he said after his marriage and the birth of his daughter, this was the best thing he ever did in his life. And still says that. Really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. How about a favorite moment? Crossing the river. Crossing the river. Crossing the river. I finally got to swim the Mara River. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you said the hippos were in the river when you did that? Yeah. Pretty yeah. just yeah. got looked and moved them down again, but this time they responded correctly. <laughs> good, good. Yeah, because they can be pretty cranky critters. They can. But this is a place where horses cross regularly, and so the hippos that live in that area are used to it. And, um, gotcha. Yeah. And actually, the only thing bad happened there was there was a stick sticking out, and Brad rammed his knee into it, and he was a little sore. But, oh. You know, it's those sticks that get you every time. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll do it. Well, if you're going to get injured in Africa, at least it's just a stick. You're right. Right. I'm sure Brad's listening and going, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to scroll through here and see what kind of questions we have. Great. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of people that look like uh, they're, they're interested. It's, it's, gosh, the story, all these stories are great. I won't lie. You'd start talking about tents and camp, and the princess comes out in me, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. And then you mentioned morning tea and gourmet meals and the afternoon nap and candlelit dinners. And I'm okay. thinking, well, yeah. Anyone will tell you I am not a camper, okay? I, I, don't, I don't like being out in the middle of the night. This is like glamping. Yes, I remember you saying that before. Glamping, glamorous camping. Yeah, glamping, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. My idea of camping is having to pack my own iron for the hotel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, they'll iron all your clothes for you. That's awesome. Oh, I might never leave. I know. Brad doesn't want to ever leave. <laughs> uh, oh gosh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So let me see in here. Uh, we do actually have one question come in from Samantha and it's not safari related are you okay to field that one sure. okay cool so her question is um, how do you start or what do you do when you need to start a pony that you're too big for that's a great idea great question. Oh, oh, long lining long lining perfect that was that would have been my answer as well so yep. awesome yep so Samantha long lining is going to be uh, definitely is going to help you out with that idea um, and Brad just said that they polish your boots every night for you too. So yeah, I'm, if they're if they're gonna iron my clothes, polish my boots, and serve me tea, I'm probably not coming home from Africa. So. Oh, and an open bar 24/7. Oh well. I, Did I mention the amarula, which is made from the nut of the uh, amarula tree that the elephants love to eat because it ferments, and it's like a Bailey's only better. Really. And you have that at night. Before. Before you say jumbo to your pillow, yeah. Did I mention that? You didn't. Yeah. You didn't. Yeah. Uh, you're uh, starting to sound like Mary now. You're you're uh, <laughs> you're you're convincing me. Well, you said you were going to come with us. That's it. That's it. That's oh my gosh! I can't wait. I can't wait. I will definitely do it at some point. Can't can't promise yeah. when. I know my schedule for next year is already booked up full. So right, right. Uh, so we'd have to plan on 2020 for you. 2020. Uh, well, I. Yeah, we'll have to talk to my manager about that. Right, well, she'll come with you, right? <laughs> that's it, that's it, she better. So, awesome, awesome. Well, this has been great. This has yeah, been and great. I, and again, if anybody wants information on Safari, they can email me at wendy at wendyfromerback.com or message Perfect. me on Facebook or go to my website and send me a contact through there or contact Brad. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. I actually do a lot of the answering. Good um, deal. Yeah. 
Good deal. Perfect. And I'll make sure that we get all of that information up in the notes on here uh, for anybody to get in touch with you about that also. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're going to wrap this one up then. So uh, you know how we roll with all of these. You've, you've joined me a few times now for this one. So uh, we need a question of the day for everybody. Oh, I'm simple. What's on your bucket list? Oh, perfect. Perfect. What is on your bucket list? Gang, put that in the comments section uh, of this video. And of course, if your bucket list includes Safari Africa, uh, horseback safari, then you need to get in touch with Wendy about that because it sounds like an awesome time. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much, Wendy. As always, this is an absolute blast. Yeah. Uh, anytime, Patrick. It's really fun. I enjoyed a lot. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. So, gang, I want to thank you for tuning in for episode number 20 of Talking About Horses. I really appreciate you giving Wendy and I your ear. Please remember that if you've missed any of it, you can access the full broadcast, again, through Facebook, YouTube, or by streaming from iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from, through whatever outlet you're listening. Please be sure to give us a rating, a comment, a review, and a share. Your word of mouth is the fuel for this fire. Next Thursday is the Thanksgiving holiday here in the U.S., so I'll be spending some time with the family. Be sure to tune back in the following Thursday, that's November 30th, for my chat with gated horse expert and clinician, Liz Graves. Thanks, gang.